a call by Kenya's opposition to stay away from work on Monday has pretty much been snubbed. The opposition leader, Raila Odinga, made a call to protest last week's election results. That said, a lot of shops in Nairobi, the capital, were open for the first time in days uh, in the city's informal settlement of Kibera. Many buses, taxis are also plying their trade. Although it is an opposition stronghold, many residents say the stairway is asking way too much of them after a week without any income. Right then, so let's get you a sense of exactly how this call played out across the country. Let's start first with Alexandria Majala. She's live in the western city of Kisumu, where the opposition Raila Odinga's uh, hometown, uh, with the latest developments from over there. Um, Alexandria, this call to stay away from work um, was pretty public. What was the reaction like in Kisumu and its environs? Well, Rama, interestingly, this was one of the areas where people expected a uniform boycott of work, but interestingly, people actually did show up to work. What we saw instead was a lot more economic activity compared to the last week or so. So it's been interesting to note that people did decide to show up for work. What they did say was that as much as they stand in solidarity with Ryla, they do have to put food on the table, and they simply cannot afford to continue staying home and not making a living. Most of the people here are largely self-employed. Most of the population is the youth and they engage in economic activities. And so the, the business coming to a slow or, or a slump in business did adversely affect them and their families. And they felt that the wisest thing to do was to come to work today and wait for direction tomorrow from the opposition leader, Raila Odinga. Rama? Indeed. So given, given the roadblocks that we've seen in some days and the general sense of, of uncertainty in the city, our business is getting even the supplies they need to get operations up and running again. Well, I can say that there has been a definite effect on the economic, in the, on the local economy here. Uh, Kisumu does trade a lot with neighboring counties. The main economic activity is fishing. And when fish cannot be transported from here to other places because of the roadblocks, take a few days ago, you could not go to and from the airport. It would have been a futile effort. The road that leads to Kakamega, which is another county that trades with Kisumu, and its farmers usually brings fresh produce, uh, to sell to, to people here. The road that leads there was passing right through Kondele, which, as we all know, was one of the hotspots. So it's definitely had an, an, an effect, a ripple effect for that matter, on neighboring counties. And I'm sure counties like Nairobi are also, who also rely, you know, for some of the things like fish from Kisumu, are trading with something, some counties like uh, Turkana, which are much, much further. So business has been affected and it has had an effect on neighboring counties. Rama. Indeed, we'll leave it there for the time being. Thank you for the update. That, of course, was uh, Alexandria Majale in the western city of Kisumu. Right then, so we've, we've looked at that particular region, but let's pull back and look at the country as a whole. Habilo Laka, the CEO of the Kenya Bankers Association, is live in the studio with me um, tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Right then, so call to not go to work comes out um, over the weekend. What happened among your members? Were, were people back to work? Were operations back to normal? Actually, we pretty didn't feel it as a banking sector because uh, one is that um, uh, last week mm -hmm. we operated normally, mm -hmm. other than on Tuesday when we closed because of the of the voting, the voting day itself. Yeah. Uh, the, from Wednesday all the way to Friday we were operating normally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, branches were open in most uh, areas, even those that were bound to have been affected. Banks were operating normally, mm -hmm. um, so we didn't we didn't feel it. And today just back to business as usual. Right, let's let's pull back though and expand this conversation around say the second quarter to date because what we've seen since then is this three month consecutive contraction in the Stanbic uh, PMI. I believe the, the record low we hit was about 47.3, which is basically a contraction um, in the month of July. We've seen a pretty steep slowdown in private sector lending as well. What's, what sort of damage, trying to quantify this for us, what sort of damage has all this pre-election fear and uncertainty done to the banking sector? I think we were already, you know, there was um, the, the progressive contraction in terms of credit expansion, um, uh, which meant that um, uh, effectively, the, you know, the economic growth was slowing down and uh, credit was not picking up as much as it should have. So when the election fever started, you know, um, coming in, it was more or less worsening a situation that was already deteriorating, you know. So 
we cannot attribute the slowdown specifically to the election fever, but it did contribute significantly to, to, the, to, the, to, to the banking sector, you know, in ability to expand you know, credit because there was a slowdown in activity, partly because most investors were taking a, a wait and see approach. And with that kind of thing, then there isn't as much investment and therefore the need for credit slows down. Mm -hmm. So we felt it, um, um, something that started right at the beginning of the, of, the, of the year, progressing all the way up to the time when the elections were coming, mm -hmm. it was now almost reaching the, you know, the rock bottom. Yeah, so well, yeah. The Family Bank released its, uh, its, its half year numbers recently. We saw some pretty dismal performance there. They actually did report a loss. The first quarter was also pretty bad for them. We're getting into that period now where we're getting first half numbers from a lot of your members. So what should we expect? More losses, reduced profits, perhaps even job cuts being announced? I think what banks have done is a number of them have more or less looked at their business model. And uh, a number of them are adjusting in terms of uh, rationalizing the branch network, um, staff numbers being rationalized, um, um, uh, some of them re adjusting their business models in terms of how they, how they operate. Um, and so we are not expecting that uh, we will see some general uh, deterioration in terms of financial performance, mm -hmm. but it will not be as bright as would otherwise have you know, expected in a normal year. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are hopeful in the sense that um, going forward, we hope to start seeing you know, things picking up, especially once the conditions on the ground change. Mm -hmm. And we see some positivity. The political conditions. People you yes, mean. political conditions. People start now looking at uh, the economy in a more positive way, mm -hmm. especially given the elections have been fairly successful. Um, um, despite the noise that was created, I think it went on fairly smoothly. It has been judged as a free, fair, and credible election. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, I think the investor confidence is finally coming back, and we'll see more activity beginning to pick up, especially in the fourth quarter of this year. All right, one last question for you. Um, and we've had this conversation before. Um, the imposition of rate caps was a pretty big deal um, in September last year. But now that the elections are out of the way, you've got possibly a majority in, the, in Parliament for, for Jubilee as, as a legislative body. Um, same president, same ideas around the economy. Are we likely to see the rate caps lifted by the end of the year? I think we are now in a good position to get into a discussion. Um, uh, within, when it was still noisy, it was a bit difficult to bring the question up, up to the table. But right now, given that um, we have seen the impact it has had, not only on growth, credit growth, but also the impact on the economic growth, I think we can now sit down and have a discussion. Uh, one of the fears that um, uh, most commentators have had is the fact that um, if the rate caps are removed, will we go back to where we were? in terms of you know, banks you know, being loose and uh, hiking the rates and all that. And what you have done is you have tried to put in place some safeguards. One is, for example, transparency, so that banks can be more transparent in terms of how they price the products. We have put in our framework, cost of credit um, framework, where it's, it's a free disclosure to the customer. The customer can be able to you know, check across the various providers and be able to gauge which one is more competitively priced. Also, we have put in place, um, you know, the Inuka Enterprise Development Program, which is trying to create capacity and therefore enabling the SMEs to be able to access credit. Now, with all those initiatives, I think we have got a framework where we are demonstrating to the market that um, um, if these rate caps were removed, credit will be able to start flowing, especially to the needy areas, which are the more um, contributors to the economic growth, SMEs and the like. All right, we'll leave it there for the time being. Thank you for your time, Mr. Lacker. Appreciate it.